Okay. Um, so yeah, the uh, title is um, a little bit ambiguous because um, I'm using animation as more of a generic term. This, I guess, could be more called something like uh, cross-platform interactive applications and games uh, with high-performance graphics with WebGLs and WebGIS, but it then wouldn't fit nicely on the slide. So um, I've just compressed that down to animation as a generic term for uh, graphics and um, we'll just have to live with it, sadly. So that's my Twitter handle at the bottom there, RobNet. Um, and the two things that I'm involved with, uh, obviously the UA Foundation was already mentioned there. Um, that's a nonprofit organization that I run uh, to keep track um, um, and develop and maintain things like away 3 d um, and, uh, and the other uh, software that we produce. And Away Studios is my consultancy company uh, that actually generates some revenue um, and keeps us all going and keeps us all in uh, beer and pizza. Um, and yeah, so obviously uh, Away 3D is most likely the thing uh, we're known for uh, and the thing that you might have heard of. Uh, this is a Flash engine. It started in around 2007. Um, and since then, we've uh, had a community grow exponentially. So at this point, um, there's a, many people, thousands of developers and hundreds of companies around the world that actually use Away 3D in various different projects. Um, there's a lot of different uh, things, but a lot of uh, uh, companies use Away 3D for games, um, for things like applications, um, and uh, so it's kind of varied, but uh, there is uh, a lot of things like Facebook games um, and uh, desktop games as well. Um, and uh, more recently, uh, more mobile applications have started being developed with Way 3D. Um, using the Air uh, platform, you can actually get a reasonable performance on uh, mobile devices with uh, uh, Way 3D and the Stage 3D APIs, which is the accelerated APIs that Flash uh, uh, created around ten, uh, about five years ago now. Uh, so that's been uh, tr trucking along nicely. Um, but the thing that I actually wanted to talk to you about today uh, was HTML5 games. Now, this is almost a dirty word to some people, <laughs> um, and I'm a little bit apprehensive even having it on screen, but this is something which I feel is a real problem at the moment. Um, HTML5 games um, have a bit of an image crisis because, generally speaking, they don't have the, the tooling and the performance to be able to produce something that people expect um, out of their games today. Um, and we're sort of here to try and fix that in a way. We want to try and create this uh, uh, more, more tooling and more uh, APIs that allows you to turn this into something that's, that's, that's not HTML5 games, but just games in general. Just being able to turn this into something that is expected of the platform and is expected of the device that you're running it on. Um, and uh, we can do that because uh, we have um, several things in, in uh, the, the browser space that have recently become a little bit more supported and a little bit more available to uh, browsers and uh, uh, frameworks across the board. But the main sort of driver for this, I would say, is WebGL. So if you don't know, WebGL is uh, an OpenGL um, extension in JavaScript. And what it allows is it basically allows the same kind of performance that you would get out of an OpenGL uh, framework um, in uh, the browser. And it obviously does a similar thing to what Stage 3D did back in the day uh, to Flash, where you have a context that you can render all of your graphical content into, um, and that graphical content gets offloaded to the GPU, and therefore you have very little, uh, you have very little performance issue with the graphics of your games. And this is becoming an ever-important issue, obviously, um, with mobile devices becoming such the game uh, platform that it is. And I keep saying mobile. Um, WebGL used to be discussion um, on the desktop, primarily, and about how compatible it was and whether you could actually start using it in a serious manner. But I think that those discussions are largely over now. WebGL is very well established on desktop and all the major uh, vendors, uh, browser vendors support WebGL. The real battle being fought now is on mobile, and I feel that that is where the, the, the most to be gained is, is, is had. Um, the mobile uh, platforms that currently support WebGL include things like uh, the, the uh, Chrome for Android browser, um, the uh, Opera browser, um, the beta for Firefox, and a few other, uh, a few other releases. Um, but the, the idea is that this is, a, this is a, an inevitable thing, really. Um, this is becoming much more um, of, a, of a standardized platform for development. And I think that it is definitely going in the direction of full compatibility across the board in the future. 
Um, but there are tricks that we can pull even now to be able to get around those compatibility problems as they stand at the moment. So AwayJS is um, the latest thing that we've been working on. Um, and this is started off about two years ago um, as a port from Away3D to WebGL. So essentially, uh, we were taking all of the functionality that was currently available in Away3D and then rewriting it for WebGL. Um, and that was no small task, but um, that was a while ago now. And so the, the stuff that's actually happened in between has been a series of optimizations, of realizations about uh, the, the way that we can actually uh, organize things better inside um, what is essentially now a JavaScript library. Um, how we can actually um, create things which are familiar to people coming over from Flash, um, and how we can make the whole experience a lot more palatable. Because we don't really under any illusions here. We're, we're here, we're here on this platform now uh, for the, the VM. Um, we're not here for the language. Um, and I'm not going to pretend that JavaScript is anything nice to play with um, coming from uh, the Flash community. But the, the VM is something which is very good to play with and is uh, very well supported and very stable now and very performant. And we were surprised about how, how much performance it actually does have now um, in terms of comparable performance with other platforms. Um, it, really did, it really does blow ActionScript away in some areas. So um, it was nice to see that. Um, and I, as part of this is sort of showing you how we've overcome some of the other stumbling blocks that come with this transition. So um, our code base is uh, github.com slash awayjs. Um, and that's where uh, we're sort of directing people at the moment. We don't actually have an official site yet for awayjs. Um, this is sort of the first time I've properly actually talked about a lot of these things that I'm going to show today. Um, so you're all very privileged uh, to be able to get a first glimpse. But this is uh, uh, the state of things that we have at the moment. And the idea really is to get more feedback and get more people on board um, and just get people talking about it a bit and, uh, you know, that way we can iterate and, and improve. So some of the things that we were considering when we built OAJS, um, OA3D, um, I don't know if you know, but there are other tools available that actually integrate with uh, uh, OA3D content. So you have OA Builder, which can actually uh, help with you getting your, uh, your graphic assets into OA3D. And you also have extensions for things like Maya and 3D Studio Max. And these um, simplify the design process of just getting your content into Away3D in the first place. So it was important that we actually uh, made WayJS compatible with those sorts of things. Um, another big step that we wanted to take was to make it a general purpose engine. And really all that means is just 2D and 3D, um, creating um, a system which is not, really, uh, is not necessarily taking one side over the other. Um, we have a, uh, the, the, the familiar kind of display list architecture for this sort of thing, um, but it's not a hard thing to be able to actually have 2D and 3D content sitting side by side in a way JS. Um, and the final thing, um, and possibly the most important because of the way that the wind is blowing, mobile optimized um, so that you actually have a true cross-platform uh, solution for this kind of stuff. Um, because obviously the mobile platform is the, the largest growing platform um, for these kind, this kind of content, and WebGL needs to be at the forefront of that. Um, so I can show you the actual uh, repository as it stands. Um, in GitHub, if you go to the, the link, uh, you'll see a bunch of um, libraries. Uh, there's an examples library which you can download and install uh, to just sort of try out a few things. Um, and then we have like a lot of different uh, um, what, what we're calling modules. Um, so one of the main differences between AwayJS and Away3D is that uh, AwayJS is modularized in a way that allows you to, um, well, more uh, in terms of uh, the development side, allows uh, to be able to separate development into different strands. So we have a module for uh, something called StageGL, which is essentially an abstraction of the Stage3D API uh, wrapped inside, uh, wrapping the WebGL uh, calls so that we actually have a familiar sort of base on which to build. Um, and then we have a separate renderer module, a separate uh, core module, a separate display module down the bottom, which holds all the sort of display list hierarchy objects and so on. And the reason for this is twofold, really. One is that it makes development a lot easier. Um, it makes uh, splitting teams a lot easier so that people can work on individual things in isolation. And the second is it actually makes things more manageable. Um, it, it, it actually uh, gives you some options uh, which we'll, we'll go into in a bit more depth, I guess, um, 
uh, for, uh, for optimization and also for um, just being able to um, work uh, and upgrade without having to worry about uh, the, other, the other modules as long as you leave interfaces intact. So um, it does really help, especially with an open source project like this. Um, and two things which uh, we, we did about a year ago, uh, we, we had this massive shift in the code base and it was almost completely rewritten. Uh, we started using these two tools here. Now, you don't necessarily have to know what these two things are, um, but they really saved us in terms of actual uh, development and how we were going about managing the different uh, modules at the time. Um, so NPM is uh, the uh, node package manager, uh, which is um, basically a, a way of being able to download and install dependency, mod dependency modules for a project, a JavaScript project. Um, and it's really uh, invaluable for just being able to manage this kind of stuff. If you have a project which uses certain modules, you can define a dependency uh, uh, list which is pulled in automatically whenever you install that project. So it's a very simple installation process then um, and with our modular approach, it actually makes it um, a cinch to be able to just define what you're using and then you uh, install with the package manager um, and everything uh, gets pulled in that you need. And Browserify is something which actually is like a kind of class concatenator. So in JavaScript, you end up with classes everywhere. Um, and um, there's a lot of different tools to be able to stick those together into a single distributable JavaScript file, but Browserify is the one that we settled on. We found it was the, the, the nicest for the workflow that we were using, uh, for the kind of class structure that we're using, which is very AS2-like, uh, sorry, AS3-like. And uh, yeah, we, it, it was, it was, it's, it, if you want an analogy, Browserify is like your SWIC, um, and NPM is like your sort of library module. Um, and that's the kind of uh, workflow that we found work best with the, with the kind of source that we were dealing with. Um, and another thing which uh, really saved us in this whole development uh, saga was TypeScript. Now, um, you may not have heard of TypeScript. Um, it's nothing bad. Um, it's actually an incredibly useful tool. Um, but it's a transpiler which allows you to uh, write in a higher level uh, uh, JavaScript base to um, uh, vanilla JavaScript. And what it does is it do does two things. It adds types um, and it adds ECMA 6 features. Um, now, um, ECMA 6 is the sort of new standard for JavaScript that's still being kind of finalized at this point. Um, but the theory is that ECMA 6 is the um, the actual uh, thing that JavaScript will eventually move to. Um, and this adds certain features like class inheritance, um, uh, public-private properties, um, and all the sort of things that you would expect from an evolved language, um, which JavaScript definitely is not. So <laughs> the idea with the TypeScript is to actually give you some of that stuff early, um, and the, uh, but also give you uh, type inference on all your uh, uh, classes and modules. So um, it, it, it's it's useful on both counts, but with the ECMAScript 6 uh, stuff, it's actually um, giving you something which um, is almost like the future of JavaScript, in a way, um, and giving it to you so that you can use it right now. And the way it works is it just uh, takes your uh, code that you've written in the TypeScript format and compiles it down. Um, and this is actually um, a, a, a node project that you can include in your uh, dependencies in NPM, just like any other module that you have in a dependency. So when you set up a project, you just can include the TypeScript compiler. It comes in straight away, um, and then you can have it in your build scripts. And it's, again, a one-click, a one-shot install. So um, it's, it's actually a really nice uh, workflow. Um, if you go on to uh, the TypeScript website, uh, typescriptlang.org, there's actually a playground where you can have a little look at what it actually does. Um, and this is sort of one that I've just adapted a little for our style of coding. Um, but what you've got on the left here is TypeScript, and what you've got on the right is what the output JavaScript is. So um, you've got a few things here uh, which are sort of looking out of place from traditional JavaScript. Like you've got a class type here, um, and then you've got an extends here. Um, you have a constructor function here, which is uh, the, the sort of the standard way of defining any constructor. Uh, you don't actually need to define the constructor name. Um, and then you have things like uh, super, you have things like uh, uh, public and private. Um, and the whole thing uh, feels a lot more evolved and a lot more stable. Um, and there's kind of a lot of advantages for this besides it just looking nicer. Um, if you're working in a team, which we 
definitely are, um, passing code between each other becomes so much easier because you have everything inferred in the actual code itself. So you don't have to rely on people writing huge reams of documentation to tell you what a function does because you have the types written into the function. So it's actually very clear to see that the move function actually requires a number in its argument so that it works um, and you don't get some weird output. So it means a lot of testing is actually done at compile time rather than at runtime, which any developer will tell you is much, much better. Um, and yeah, I mean, if you, if you go to this page, you can actually see a number of other um, examples here. And you can play around in real time. So if I uh, decide to, say, take out one of these functions, uh, so this is like one of the uh, uh, functions that is inheriting from, uh, classes that are inheriting from animal, um, I can take this out and it'll actually uh, recompile once I've uh, corrected the my errors here. So now it's saying this class no longer exists um, because you've actually defined the type here, and so it can detect for that. So if I remove this as well, then it will recompile on the, on the right-hand side, and you can see this is now shrunk. Um, so it, this is a really nice way of just sort of having a look at what actually is output here, but what you can actually do in TypeScript as well. Um, and if I make a mistake, like say if I um, uh, type a, a number in here instead of, a, sorry, a string in here instead of a number, um, then it'll automatically error and won't actually compile until the error is resolved. So it gives you um, um, error messages, um, and it also uh, can, can do you know, uh, real-time checking. There's a lot of tools that are already TypeScript enabled. Uh, WebStorm is the one that we actually tend to use because it's, uh, it's, it's both on iOS and Android. Uh, sorry, um, <laughs> it's both on Mac OS um, and Windows. But uh, yeah, there's, there's Visual Studio has TypeScript built in now. Um, and uh, there's a TypeScript plugin for Eclipse. So there's a lot of different options that you can, uh, you can go with. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to use TypeScript for AwayJS. Um, AwayJS compiles down to JavaScript, and if you want, you can just use JavaScript uh, vanilla or whatever framework you want. You could use CoffeeScript or something else, um, and it would all uh, still work absolutely fine. So yeah, this is just a recap of what I just said, but um, it is amazingly handy for team projects, um, and I highly recommend you check it out, if nothing else, for that reason. Um, if you have to cut code in JavaScript, this is uh, a lifesaver, really, because of the expressiveness of the language and the ability you have to be able to check at compile time. Um, and you have uh, many ES6 standards already in there, so um, you're actually seeing what's coming in JavaScript in a way. And it is a little bit familiar, I think, especially if you're coming from something like C Sharp. The actual language syntax is very similar to C Sharp. In fact, it was developed by the same uh, guy at Microsoft. So um, there is a lot of similarities with the syntax and the, and the structure. Um, and that should make it a, an easy transition if you're thinking of trying it out. So the next thing I want to talk about is workflow. Obviously, I mentioned that Away 3D already has a lot of workflow uh, tools, but we wanted to take them all the way across to AwayJS as well so that we had those straight away. Um, we have uh, a, a, a preview tool of our own called Away Builder, which basically allows you to pull in different file formats and display them and output them um, as a single binary file. Um, but then we also have plugins for things like 3D Studio Max, which allows you to um, take your model directly from that to um, our own format. And our format is called AWD. Um, it's been going for about, oh, about four years now. Um, it's in its third revision, uh, third incarnation, I should say. Um, and uh, it supports a bunch of uh, stuff that you'd expect, uh, like uh, bones animation, vertex animation, uh, uh, geometry and uh, texture bitmaps, and everything else. Um, and the advantage of it is that it actually packages it up into a binary that is unpacked really fast at runtime. Um, with everything or ready to go uh, to be uploaded to the GPU and everything else. Um, so this is a little bit of a, a difference to what you would say is traditional uh, HTML5 coding, where you sort of have your, your source and then you have your uh, runtime, uh, the browser, as, as it were. Um, and, and this has sort of like been existing for a while, obviously, so people are hanging on to it a little bit and not necessarily so keen to let go. But um, this uh, is obviously different from the sort of thing that we're uh, doing, which has a sort of third intermediary state, which is the compiled file or your compiled game. Um, so as another analogy, I suppose in the old flash days, this used to be your Swift, um, and this on the left used to be your FLA file. Um, but there is a number of advantages for doing this sort of thing. Um, and I think people are finally waking up um, in uh, the HTML5 games world. 
uh, to the advantage that this brings. Um, not, not just about um, uh, optimization, because obviously when you have an intermediary step, you can do a lot of compression and you can do a lot of optimization for runtime inside your, your binary. Um, but it also protects people's data, um, and a lot of uh, HTML5 frameworks seem to forget this and say, no, we're going to use JSON for everything. And that's, well, that's great. Everyone can like, just strip out all your JPEG images and assets and use them in their own game. Um, but if you actually have it packaged, it's, it's a little bit more of a barrier for entry. Um, and it may not stop everyone, but it will definitely just deter people from stealing your game. Um, so we do think that this is a much better solution. Um, and the kind of thing that we used to do uh, was have something like, say, Away Builder outputting your file, and then that would run in the Away 3D engine. But uh, nowadays, we have a bunch of things. Uh, which can come from a number of different files, uh, a number of different packages, um, all outputting an AWD file, and they can all be used together in, in, in a way 3D project. Um, so, with the updates that we've made now, AWAYJS basically takes the place of AWAY 3D on the on the right. Um, everything still works. Everything still um, is compatible. Um, the file format hasn't changed. Um, and uh, you can make a, a transition very easily from an Away 3D game to an Away JS game, um, for, for your assets at least. So, um, about a year ago, uh, for reasons that will become clear, uh, we decided uh, to have a look at something that was going on in uh, the Adobe world. Adobe are still uh, sponsoring Away 3D, by the way. This is still an official. Uh, library of, uh, of Adobe. And um, we, we do still have quite a connection with them. So we heard about this uh, from the guys at the Flash, the Flash Pro team. Um, and Flash Pro uh, 2015 has a new feature um, called uh, 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 Custom Publishing, which allows you to create your own custom exporter uh, for the, the Flash Pro IDE. So what that means is you can take all the data that's being uh, written into the IDE by your designer, um, including uh, images, uh, animations, uh, scripts, and everything else, and package it into whatever you like. You can output it as uh, different uh, you know, in individual files, or you can package it into your own format. So this was quite interesting to us. Um, and there's very little about it online, actually. It's um, a bit sad, really, but it does have um, huge potential. If you actually go to Adobe, uh, the Adobe uh, Flash Professional blog, um, you'll find a post that was dated December the 17th, 2014. It's called Publish to New Platforms with a New Custom Platform Support SDK. And this basically takes you through the basics of what it actually is. Um, but it is incredibly useful. It's act actually offering low-level access to all the stuff that you get inside uh, the IDE and allowing you to do whatever you like with that data. Uh, so all the shape data and all the sound data and all the uh, animation data. Um, so we've been working with Adobe uh, for about a year now on uh, actually taking this to the next level, taking this uh, somewhere. Um, and so what I want to show you now is uh, the project that we've actually been working on, which uh, exploits this. Obviously, um, well, this hasn't been released yet, but it is very close to being released. It will most likely be out before the end um, of the month. And um, we worked with a designer uh, called Dampnat, who is based in Brighton, UK. I don't know, you may have heard of him. Um, and the project that we were working on uh, was a conversion for this game, Icicle. Um, now this is currently on iOS. Um, and the, the actual conversion process for that was done um, using a completely custom process. There was no engine involved. Uh, the actual game itself was originally a Flash game. Surprise, surprise. But it is something which is very uh, contentionally Flash in its look and feel. Um, and uh, the game in iOS was just literally converted uh, uh, line by line uh, to, uh, to C++. Um, and then uh, uh, uploaded and, uh, and, and uh, inserted into the asset store in, in uh, iOS. So, so we had a little bit of a work cut out, I guess, um, but this was to do with uh, trying to get it, do, do the same, essentially, on Android. Um, and the game is very vector heavy, which has um, turned out to be a really nice thing, because uh, with vectors, you can do uh, a lot more than just with bitmaps. But also, 
there's very few engines which actually deal with vectors in a good way at the moment in 2D, um, in, uh, in, in HTML5 games. Everything tends to be sprite sheets, everything tends to be bitmap data. Um, so it's a different sort of approach, a different kind of thing that was needed here. Um, and part of the reason why we, we, we sort of uh, stuck with the vector approach is that you get frames like this where you have very different scales. So um, things like sprite sheets wouldn't work in this kind of game. You have to have um, the ability to scale and stretch um, in an incredibly uh, diverse range. So you wouldn't get away with doing it. It would become pixelated, it would become compromised. And the whole point is the style of the game, which is very crisp outlines, very uh, you know, stylized look and feel. So one of the other things that we had to deal with, obviously, uh, with this being an Android project, was how we were going to run this on Android. Um, you can run um, in Chrome on Android at the moment, and the game actually does run in Chrome on Android, but um, that wasn't going to work for the, 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 the publisher because they obviously wanted to have something in the asset store still. So you have something that comes along with uh, uh, a wrapper just for the web view. Um, and cross, Crosswalk Project is something that's actually from Intel. It's an open source project. Um, so again, it's free to use and free to hack. Um, and um, it's uh, extremely powerful for what it actually does. It uses the latest Chromium uh, version um, of the V8 engine. Um, so it, it doesn't really lack power, and it has things like uh, web, or, uh, web Audio and WebGL built in, um, which are still not you know, necessarily that prevalent on mobile devices. But um, with something like Crosswork, you don't have to worry about that sort of thing. You can just wrap your game inside it, and you know exactly what version you're running it on. So the other thing we obviously had to do with, which is probably quite obvious to you, is uh, this is a 2D game. This is not 3D anymore. So coming from away 3D, we're not really dealing with the same aspects. We're not dealing with the same sort of um, uh, ways of handling uh, graphics. So we wanted to, um, we were very happy to add 2D to AWAJS because that was one of the sort of core things that we wanted to do. Um, but the specific type of, of thing that we, we added for this particular game um, was the ability to do uh, very uh, uh, smooth rendered curves inside uh, WebGL without having to tessellate. Well, they're having to tessellate much, I should say. Um, and what I mean by that is um, actually using shaders um, instead of uh, tessellation to get away with uh, the curve rendering. So imagine uh, this is a single triangle um, that's being rendered in WebGL. WebGL renders nothing but triangles, so this is the sort of base that you get if you go, whenever you're going to the graphics card. Um, you've got three points here. Um, but those three points could just as easily be three points of a Bezier curve. Um, and you need to have an extra ID on each point to tell the, uh, the shader whether or not you're at a curve um, ending or at a curve control point. Um, then what happens is in the fragment shader, you just shade one side or the other, um, and you end up with an incredibly smooth curve that is smooth at all resolutions. Um, and you also save yourself a bunch of tessellation because the other approach uh, to doing this kind of thing is to actually tessellate every single piece of the curve so that you get a, a bunch of straight lines that gradually form the curve. Um, and this is obviously a lot more wasteful with uh, uh, vert vertex data and, and, and will slow your, slow your whole rendering process down. So we really favor this approach, and this is what we, want, what we implemented in the end in Icicle. Um, so this is an example of, a, uh, of a, the result of this kind of approach. You have a load of interior triangles, which kind of form the basis of your shape, and then you have a lot of edge triangles, which have the curve shader applied. Um, and you can do this in a single pass, you don't have to separate it out like this, but then you end up with the thing on the uh, right there, uh, which is perfectly smooth. Cool. So, if I uh, open up my copy of Flash Pro now, um, what I've got in here is just um, a sample of the game. Uh, the game actually exports in around two minutes um, on my laptop, which is not new at all. Um, and we're, we're, there's actually things that we're doing at the moment to increase, uh, to increase that, cut it in half, essentially. Um, but uh, we use exactly the same interior functions that Adobe uses for their own exporters, for exporting to, say, you know, Swift format and so on. Um, so you get a really good head start with that sort of thing. And what this is is just some uh, a sort of snippet of the intro taken out. So if I actually scrub through the timeline here, you'll see that this is like the start. Everything is timelined, everything is vectorized. Um, 
And you have things like embedded uh, masks. So for example, the globe here is actually uh, uh, masked on the timeline. And um, you have things like uh, color transforms, nested color transforms. Um, so there's a lot going on in here. Um, oh, I'll go and pull the panel off. So, uh, yeah, so I'll just export this and, and we'll see what we get. This is using the, uh, the OHS exporter for Flash Pro now. Um, so this is a completely new target. Obviously, we have you know, the stuff from Max and the stuff from Maya, but uh, Flash Pro is now a new target in, uh, uh, in the exp exp Away Tools set. And once it loads, it loads inside a, a browser. Um, it loads inside its own um, uh, server, which is actually inbuilt into Flash Pro now. Um, and you can see the whole thing playing back. So this is, this is getting there. This is actually getting to a now familiar process, a familiar sort of uh, test and publish process, where you have uh, you know, a familiar IDE, uh, something that uh, a lot of graphic designers still use for 2D graphics, has to be said. Um, and uh, you have a, a, an output that is actually usable uh, now on uh, things like uh, mobile with WebGL. Uh, so, oh, before I talk about that. So, would you like to see the whole game? Yeah? yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, this is current, this is just running locally. I do have this um, on my phone as well, but um, I, I, my uh, adapter didn't seem to work for some reason today. So, uh, if you want to actually see it running on the device, come up to me afterwards. Um, but this is just the same thing running in the browser. We should have sound as well. Oh, it's not coming out. So if I skip that and go straight into the game, now we're actually getting everything um, interactive and everything uh, Set up for, um, for well, this is just this is just using the, key, the, the keys, cursor keys, but you have the, the sort of the buttons here uh, for uh, mobile use. Um, and all the interactions are exported from our exporter as well. So you have uh, uh, we we have actual uh, scripts being uh, converted to compatible JavaScript uh, or runnable JavaScript, I should say, saved as strings inside the file, and then at runtime. They're uh, unpacked and evolved, um, and then executed exactly as the script would normally be executed. And this is all. This is all a WebGL context. This entire thing is just one massive WebGL context. So we have. Uh, so here, obviously, you're using things like masks for the for the shop. Um, you're using. Uh, uh, buttons and so on for the, the tabs up here, and everything is, is uh, si simulated and emulated in WebGL. Um, but a lot of this is actually using JavaScript as well. So things like the actual display stack, we have a bunch of uh, uh, logic inside WebJS now, which actually emulates the adding and, re adding and removal of uh, movie clips. So you have a nested time, uh, you have a nested display hierarchy like we had in way 3D, but now you also have the ability, uh, the sort of movie clip ability to be able to define a timeline that you can have uh, these sort of commands on, and all you need to do is set it up in uh, Flash Pro and export it just like you would as Swift. So there's still some stuff to do here. Um, there's a few things that I want to talk about uh, just before we end um, about optimizations because this um, runs on mobile, but it's it's uh, still you know still limited to uh, certain devices. We're not actually able to uh, run this on uh, older devices, sadly. Um, so you know we're having to restrict that, which is not necessarily a problem, but you know it would it would be nice to have in the future. Um, and so uh, yeah, the last thing I just want to mention um, is certain things that you can uh, do to optimize and certain things which are coming in the future which will allow us to optimize this even more. But as it is, it actually runs pretty well, um, considering that this is running in the JavaScript VM with WebGL.
So the issue around optimization is all about mobile, really. Um, like I say, in desktop, we don't have an issue with optimization. Everything uh, runs extremely fast. But um, mobile still offers a challenge. Um, and this is sort of the, 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 the guts of it, really. Mobiles are getting smaller and becoming much more high resolution. Um, and there's nothing you can really do to stop that. The problem with the size is not about the actual size of the screen, but the actual physical weight of the mobile device itself, uh, which means that processors um, have a real restriction on how hot they get. Um, and so manufacturers have basically switched to, to the strategy of just making everything parallel. So processors now have, say, four or eight cores inside, um, and you have uh, parallel processors going on inside them. Um, and of course, the GPU, which is incredibly parallel, so a lot of stuff is just offloaded to that now. Um, and that, this is kind of not a, uh, you know, it's, it's not even getting just started yet. It's really just sort of, uh, uh, just sort of beginning to happen. So I think that this will continue uh, to the nth degree in the future because everybody wants something that's, that's smaller and flatter, right, uh, but with more power. Um, so what we really should be talking about is parallel optimizations. Um, and these sorts of things uh, um, have been around, obviously, for ages um, uh, in other platforms. But in JavaScript, we're only really just getting started. Um, what sort of things are we looking at at the moment? Um, one of the first things that we've actually tried, tried out implementing um, is SMID, which is something which is um, in, a, uh, in a W3C uh, standards submission at the moment. Um, but it hasn't really been implemented in many places. Um, but one of the few places it has been implemented, uh, luckily for us, is in the Crosswalk API. So um, SMID for JavaScript is actually something that Intel is supporting. And um, Crosswalk, being an Intel product, has that already enabled. So um, if you have uh, the, a compatible processor, then you ha can enable SMID and it will run um, using uh, four simultaneous uh, uh, floats for your, for your calculations if you, as long as you've set it up inside the JavaScript. And all it is is just a, a, a single sort of global um, entry function which allows you to create and destroy uh, 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 float for objects which then uh, multiply and add and so on in parallel. Another thing which is actually um, available in a lot more systems is worker threads. This is where uh, you create a separate JavaScript file um, that you define as a worker, um, and then that actually allows you to execute it independently of the main thread. So you don't have to worry about uh, uh, things like uh, game logic slowing down your rendering, for example. You can actually render th uh, uh, using a separate uh, base thread and then have uh, uh, another thread for your game logic, uh, for your hit detection, and for other kind of processor intensive things. And finally, WebGL 2.0 which is um, still in a standard, uh, uh, sorry, still being spec'd at the moment, um, but has uh, a lot of things which actually offload more to the GPU. So it, does, it, it, do that, it, it has functions which allow you to reduce, say, the number of draw calls that you have to call per frame, or the number of times you have to create attributes per frame, um, uh, or define vertex buffers per frame. You can uh, reduce all of that with uh, a lot of the features in WebGL 2.0, and that will obviously um, add to the performance increases as well. Um, and you can use some of the stuff in WebGL straight away, in fact, because uh, WebGL still has extensions uh, in the 1.0 version which allow you to use 2.0 features if they're available. It's just that without being uh, like an official platform version yet, you don't necessarily have uh, uh, hardware and software uh, being made compatible with WebGL 2.0 across the board but you can still experiment if you know that your browser supports it. So it's all still there if you want to actually try it out and uh, see what kind of performance gains you get. Um, so I'm going to be around for the rest of the day if anyone has any questions. Um, but I do think we have a little bit of time, like five minutes for some now. Um, but that's my talk. Thank you very much. Test? Yep. Are there any questions? Raise your hands, please. Okay. Hi. Uh, what's Hi. the currently uh, viable mobile platform, I mean, mobile device for, for the, uh, let's say, runnable version of this 2D, uh, 2D platform you developed? Uh, so. The, um, so my current device is an S4, uh, a Galaxy S4. Um, and it runs fine on that. So I think that we're talking about maybe um, uh, a couple of generations behind. 
Um, it's, it's strange, though, because um, stuff like the, uh, the S6 and the Tab um, S2 doesn't necessarily have a huge amount of uh, extra speed um, because, again, it's dealing with this parallelization of, uh, of speed across uh, multiple cores and all the rest of it. So the clock speed isn't really any different. Um, so when you're dealing with actual execution of JavaScript, um, you'll actually get quite a consistent uh, performance for I mean, back about two years of devices. Um, but obviously with more, the more recent ones, um, once we uh, have a chance of implementing some more parallelization in the, in the, op you know, the options we have, we can actually take advantage of that and create stuff which is much faster on the, on the most recent devices. Uh, so there's still a way to go, but at the moment, it probably runs on a two-year-old device just fine. Yeah, hi. Um, the export uh, to uh, the WebGL um, from, from Flash to WebGL was pretty impressive, but uh, I was wondering uh, how code-heavy the project was. Was it AS2, was AS3, um, and how big are the chances that my seven-year-old Flash project will run through this converter flawlessly? Right, so, so what I didn't get a chance to show you was um, the actual converter we had. So this was AS2, the, the whole code base was AS2. Um, and uh, one of the things we also wrote for the project is um, a little command line converter uh, which takes the AS2 code and makes it JavaScript compatible, essentially. Um, so it's uh, basically adding, um, in fact, I, if you had a look at the, uh, some of the, I, I'm, I've been told uh, by Reese that I can't show any, any code at all, but I can probably show you one line. <laughs> Just, that's not, that's not going to be too damaging, right? Uh, but if you have a look in here, um, you can see that what we've added, um, Oh, sorry, it's still all the way down the bottom. Is um, a scoped arg uh, at the front, which then actually uh, links into the scope of the uh, of the timeline. So uh, this is sort of what you have to do, and you could you could do it manually, but we just wrote a little uh, command line tool that does this automatically for the whole project. So uh, when you ex when you save these files as XFL files rather than FLAs, you get a bunch of uh, XML files which contain all the scripts for the entire game, and then it's easy to actually write a command line utility to sweep that and convert it all to something that's runnable in JavaScript. Um, so yeah, it's not uh, something that is prescriptive. Uh, we could do exactly the same for AS3, for example. Um, and it would be nice, yeah, it would be nice to get the chance to do that in the future with another one, uh, another project that actually is AS3, uh, written in AS3 to start with. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's quite easy to do once you have that in place. Any questions else? No, I had a question. Um, okay. I would like to know, uh, since you're working with Flash and Adobe on this, uh, what's your personal opinion on the whole predicting Flash is going, down, uh, going to die for almost five, six years? People yeah. are predicting it. Yes. And yeah, what's your personal opinion on that? Um, I, don't, I don't think any of those tend to hold water. And things are, are still continuing with Flash. And we shouldn't you know, write Flash off necessarily, especially if you have legacy stuff running on Flash in the browser. Um, you know, it's sad to see Firefox doing these kind of scare tactics where they take Flash off for a day and then put it back on. And, you know, it, it's a kind of dick move. And I, I don't really know why they have to behave like that. But um, I, I don't think that, you know, uh, if you have a Flash project that's currently online and it's, and it's and it, you know, it's already written, then I think, you know, that's still got a lot of life in it. Um, but part of the reason why we wanted to make this switch to WebGL and start actually telling people about it is that I think that certainly in the future, you'll be uh, better suited to, to using something like WebGL and AwayJS because um, the trajectories are, uh, are different. Obviously, Flash is, is still declining, whether we like it or not, but WebGL seems to be on the rise. So that would essentially uh, you know, result in future to better support, better features, uh, better compatibility, better speeds. And WebGL is becoming available on a lot more devices now. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's good to see that, and it's something that we want to be able to pursue in the future. Also, people have a bit of a problem separating the player and the tool. Um, you know, being called the same thing, I suppose, doesn't help. But um, the actual uh, IDE, Flash Pro, is far from dead. I do not think that that's at all really connected to the same sort of scaremongering that the Flash player is subjected to. Um, because uh, a lot of 2D designers still use it, um, even if it's just for prototyping. Um, and then they have to, you know, get a C coder in to actually code the game for them. But, you know, this sort of thing is just a broken workflow. It's not a broken tool. Um, so um, I think that there's still a lot of value in the Flash Pro tool, which is why we actually invested the time to create um, our exporter. 
because it is still such a, a great tool for 2D work. Oh, we've got one more over there. Yep. Uh, yeah, while developing uh, AwayJS, you've probably done a lot of side-by-side -side comparison uh, when it comes to performance. Mm -hmm. um, how does a, a Adobe Air application with Away3D compare to a AwayJS uh, application in a, in, a, uh, in a web view wrapper on mobile? Um, so, actually, for, the, for this particular project, we haven't um, done comparisons because um, it would be pointless. Um, ActionScript 2 does not run in Air. So, <laughs> unless we wanted to rewrite everything in ActionScript 3, it would be impossible to test. I can tell you, though, that um, as far as uh, graphics performance is concerned, uh, WebGL is easily as fast as Stage 3D ever was now. In fact, I think um, I've seen more recently in, in, say, the last six months, Chrome actually become faster. Uh, Chrome is generally the fastest uh, implementation of WebGL that there is at the moment. Um, and it's been like that for a few years now. But everything else is pretty close behind. Firefox is, is almost identical in terms of speed. And then, you know, uh, uh, even stuff like Safari and IE perform very well. In fact, IE performs exceptionally well on WebGL. They've done a really good job with that. So, um, so yeah, uh, the, the actual uh, graphics performance um, is right out there. And there's really uh, very little to separate it. Uh, maybe you can ask a follow-up question, uh, especially yeah. in game development. It's always very important uh, to have easy um, tools to create UI in games and not just a, a 3D environment, but mixing UI elements with 3D content and then another UI element on top and then mixing that a lot. Um, what are yeah. your plans on, on UI in AwayJS? Yeah, right. So um, with, the, with the introduction of 2D in OAJS, uh, we're now in a really good position to be able to create some demos that have uh, you know, your standard 2D UI over the top of 3D. Um, and that's perfectly possible right now in OAJS. We've just really only just come off this project recently. And so I think really our next uh, few weeks are going to be focused on producing some more demos that are using it in this sort of way. Because there's nothing stopping you from being able to develop your UI in Flash. Um, and your uh, 3D models and say uh, Max, and be able to combine the two in a way JS, and they'll work seam seamlessly um, in the, within the same WebGL view. So um, it's the features, the functionality is already there. We just need to get writing demos really. So is there something like a library like Feathers on the horizon, or uh, well, we, um, we did uh, uh, sort of take over the the, the code base that uh, the Starling was writing for its a way JS implementation a while back. Um, and, that, and some of that has sort of, uh, sort of influenced our, um, 3D, our, our 2D additions in AwayJS um, as they stand. But um, I think we actually want to go further than uh, the, the Starling port does um, and add much more. In fact, you know, things like uh, text fields, for example, um, it's actually quite a nice uh, option to be able to have those rendered as smooth curves rather than uh, pre-rendered bitmaps uh, if you have you know, a game that demands it. So these sorts of features already exist um, and you know, we're adding to them all the time. So uh, yeah, we, we, we do like the stuff that uh, Starling can produce and there are certain things that we want to uh, include in there uh, that isn't currently in a way JS. But uh, we have already added a lot more to it than that. So there's, there's plenty to, to choose from when it comes to 2D functionality, yeah. Thanks. More questions? I'll be around for the no. rest of the day if you want to come up and like have a, or have a look at the game itself running and uh, see what you think. And yeah, just uh, grab me. Okay, then please give it up again for Rob Abin.